We're going to just begin by apologizing. We had a technical difficulty there. Uh, but a good evening to all. I'm Erin Burnett. And out front tonight, we begin with breaking news. The U.S. confirms tonight that Putin has used hypersonic missiles in Ukraine. This, as President Biden this evening warned Ukraine is pushing Putin to his limit and that the Russian president now is growing more dangerous. And now Putin's back against the wall. And the more his back is against the wall, the greater the severity of the tactics he may employ. Those tactics, according to Biden, now include those hypersonic missiles, which can fly 10 times the speed of sound and evade many anti-missile systems. It's a clear sign Putin is upping the ante, using longer range artillery fire and missiles at civilians as well. They've been frustrated. Uh, they have failed to achieve a lot of their uh, objectives on the ground. They're lobbing an awful lot of, of hardware into these cities uh, to try to, to, to force their surrender. Um, and it's increased over the last few days. One of those cities suffering constant attacks is Mariupol, home to some of the greatest horrors of Putin's war thus far. Just today, cars carrying children trying to flee the violence were attacked. According to Ukraine, two of those children are now in critical condition. We still have no idea how many of the more than 1,000 missing civilians who were sheltering in a school and theater in Mariupol are alive. Absolutely no word about that in days. But attacks like the ones we are seeing here have the United States and other allies accusing Putin of violating international law. Uh, we certainly see clear evidence that Russian forces are committing war crimes. What's happening in Mariupol is a massive war crime destroying everything. We're going to have much more from Mariupol in just a moment. I'm going to speak to a man who literally just fled the besieged city. His eyes seeing what we all are desperately want to know what is happening. He just saw that hours ago. And we're also hearing tonight from the woman who took this video of Russian forces firing on protesters in Kherson. I'm going to warn you, the video is graphic. She told CNN that the purpose of the gathering was to tell the Russian troops to go home. Instead, they open fire. You see there a man hit, uh, looks like hit on the leg, bleeding. The brutal assault comes as Russian forces are said to be having command and control problems. And this is an incredible thing. Multiple sources are now telling CNN that the United States of America is unable to determine if Putin even has a military commander leading his war, a war in which he has involved 150,000 troops around the border, plus 40,000 he already might have had in Donbass. I mean, it is a stunning thing. Fred Plekin begins our coverage out front live in Kyiv tonight. And Fred, what is the latest on the ground where you are? Mm. Hi there, Aaron. Well, it certainly seems a bit of a more quiet night tonight than it was, for instance, uh, last night. But, of course, we did have a lot of air raid sirens and anti-aircraft fire going on. What we have seen uh, throughout the course of the evening is that there have been those air raid silence, however, fewer impacts uh, than we have seen, uh, for instance, the night before. However, we also did hear some gunfire, some outgoing gunfire. And, of course, throughout the past 24 hours, it really has been a lot going on, especially towards the northeast uh, of Kiev, which is, of course, one of the major front lines here of this war. And as the U.S. once again reiterates, today, uh, they say that it is still one of the Kremlin's main objectives to try and win Kiev. Now, some of the video uh, that you're seeing right now on your screen there, that was a shopping mall that was hit by massive ordnance from the Russians. We were at the scene of that uh, earlier today, and I can tell you there was utter devastation uh, at that shopping mall. One building just completely annihilated, and a lot of the housing blocks around there were badly damaged as well. In fact, we were on the 8th floor, uh, on the 11th floor, sorry, of a building that was, I would say, at least three, four hundred yards away from that explosion. And we still found massive shrapnel well inside that building. So obviously very dangerous for the people who live there. The city council here in Kiev is saying that at least eight people died. And of course, the big question then becomes, Aaron, why did the Russians strike it? Now, the Russians are saying that the uh, Ukrainian military was hiding multiple rocket launchers there and also ammunition as well, and that's why they struck it. We got in touch with the Ukrainian military. They claim that that is not true, that there would have been more secondary explosions if that would have been the case. So really, there's a back and forth with that. Um, 
that area that you're seeing on your screen, it's very close to the front line, Aaron. Um, I'd say about seven kilometers, so a little under five miles away from the front line. And while we were there, uh, I can tell you that we did see a lot of outgoing uh, rocket artillery fire. We did hear a lot of booms as well, and we certainly saw a lot of smoke on the horizon. So you can see just how close the front line still is to the capital of Kiev, uh, even though as Russian forces appear to be bogged down and not making very much headway at all, Aaron. All right, Fred, thank you very much. Live in Kyiv tonight. And for more, I want to bring in retired Army Major General James Spider Marks and Paul Colby, former chief of the CIA Central Eurasia Division. He served at the CIA for 25 years and was stationed in the former Soviet Union. Thanks very much to both of you. General Marks, I want to start uh, with uh, the headline I just shared, which was so stunning. Multiple sources telling CNN tonight that the U.S. is unable to determine if Vladimir Putin actually has a military commander leading this war. I mean, that is a pretty stunning thing that the United States of America, by the way, whose intelligence on this has been nothing short of stunning, right? right. They do not know if he has a military commander leading the war. Well, there are reasons to determine that or at least come to that assessment, right? The, the military that we're seeing, the Russian military that we've seen in action has been stumbling poorly, has not been able to execute maneuver combat. The, the synchronization of the various combat arms does not exist. They engage with isolated elements. There's, there's no effort of a three-dimensional fight, which is how you engage with other units. Clearly, you would come to the conclusion that there's nobody in charge. What you have is individual units that have individual targets, but there's nobody synchronizing all of that with the command and control element. Paul, does that shock you to hear or not, given what you know about Putin? Well, the performance shocked me, and the, the poor performance that uh, uh, General Marks and others have, have laid out really is stunning. Um, I'm sure there's a chain of command. I just don't think it sounds like it's being very effectively managed. Uh, General Marks, I just want to share with you um, some uh, reporting that we're just getting in here. Uh, and this is um, numbers of, of dead and injured Russian soldiers. Okay, so there is a, a news website in Russia a Russian tabloid that reported some numbers that we have heard nothing like. We heard, what, 500 out of Russia? Well, now a Russian tabloid reports that the number of killed soldiers, Russian soldiers, is almost 10,000, just, just a few hundred shy of that. And then another of injured soldiers is 16,000. So that's 26,000 dead or injured Russian soldiers in one month, which is nearly 20% of the entire force Putin had staged around the border. The death numbers are more than the U.S. sustained in 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Now, this was on a tabloid, uh, but it's a, a, in Russia, right? This is where this appeared. So I, I can't speak to, uh, you know, the sourcing of it, obviously, myself. But this is coming out of Russia. This is what they, uh, this tabloid is reporting. These numbers are stunning. Yeah, it's staggering. This is a little more than a motorized rifle division. I mean, this, this is 10,000 dead and 16,000 wounded. Those soldiers are out of the mix, and they have to be evacuated. They have to do things with it. So it not only has the effect of the 26,000, Aaron, but you then have additional soldiers that have to extract those soldiers, care for those soldiers, get them into hospitals, get them back, or you leave them alone. But the point is, yeah. it is a devastating number to the Russian military to have that type, that, those numbers of casualties. And to follow up on one point, the, the fact that we don't think there's somebody in charge, this leads to that, and that we're mm. really looking at a military that isn't led at all. That's one of the major issues when you look at this Russian military, no non-commissioned officers and no sense of initiative. In the US military, you have a task and a purpose. In the Russian military, it's do what I say, don't take the initiative. Well, I mean, it is incredible. And I think uh, General just used two crucial words there, staggering and devastating, uh, if these numbers are, are the case. And, and uh, Paul, let me to give you some context, right? So this is a, a Russian tabloid. They put these numbers out. 10,000 dead Russian soldiers, 16,000 injured in 26 days. They cite figures when they do this that they say come from Russia's Ministry of Defense. And it stays up for 21 hours, this story. And then suddenly the story is, is swoop, uh, taken away. The post is gone as if it were, were never there. What do you read into that? Look, it's important to note that this paper, this tabloid, Komsomolskaya Pravda, is a pro-Kremlin paper. Uh, 
has long history back in the Soviet Union. So it, if you were to look at the front page today, you would have no idea there was a war taking place uh, in Ukraine. Uh, lots of uh, pictures of flowers in springtime. Um, but the fact that this number was reported in that paper, a pro-Kremlin paper, 20 times more than had been officially reported, as you noted, almost 10,000, really is stunning. That means that a wide Russian population has had a chance to look at this and absorb what that means. It means a couple of different things. One is they've immediately come out and uh, said, well, we were, we were hacked, uh, you know, this is, this is not accurate. Well, the number, regardless, is much closer to reality than the few that the Kremlin reported. It shows that the country can't be hermetically sealed. So either there was a leak of information from the Ministry of Defense that was reported in what looks like an anti-war movement, or it was hacked, true information was inserted, and it shows the country can't be hermetically sealed, that it, truth is going to seep in, and as truth seeps in, support for the war and support for Putin will seep out. And, and General Marks, I mean, the reality is, as truth, see, truth seeps in, um, you know, th that many dead and injured, that, that, is, that is going to affect a broad swath of Russian society. Oh, completely. Just think about it for a second. These Russian soldiers that are now captured, that are now going, they're in the hands of the Ukrainian soldiers, and they're putting these young Russian, Russian soldiers up on social media. They're pulling out their cell phones and they're saying, talk to your mom and dad. We're going to post this. We're going to send this back home. Send a message to your mother. Tell her how, how you're faring here in Ukraine and what you're really up to. That's incredibly powerful. And the aggregate weight of that is, is quite phenomenal. The information warfare is clearly being won by the Ukrainians. And again, I, I'm just going to make the point here. That is 17 percent of the entire force, right, that we talked about for a month that Putin was amassing along that horseshoe around Ukraine. 17 percent of them, according to those numbers, uh, would have already been killed or injured. It is staggering. Thank you both so very much. And next, we're going to take you to Mariupol, a city that, to, according to Ukrainian President Zelensky, is being literally reduced to rubble. And I'm going to speak to one man who has been there throughout, just managed to get out this weekend. The details of his journey and the loved ones he had to stay behind. Plus, I'll speak to a Russian actress who is speaking out against Putin and also against her own father, a famous Putin supporter. And the video is hard to watch. A Boeing packed with people nosedives before crashing. How did it happen? I'm Ed Lavendera in Medica, Poland. This is CNN. Tonight, the Ukrainian city of Mariupol under constant attack after the city refused to surrender to Russia. One Ukrainian officer telling CNN bombs are falling every 10 minutes. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky standing firm tonight. Hardworking, honest city of Mariupol which is being destroyed by the occupiers and being reduced to ashes, but it will survive. Well, Phil Black is out front with a look at the devastation in Mariupol tonight, and I want to warn you, some of the images may be disturbing. Between the shelling and airstrikes in Mariupol, people emerge to do what they can for the living and the dead. This man says he hopes these graves are only temporary that the bodies will be reburied someday. They spend much of their time sheltering in what remains of the buildings and often beneath them. Basements offer some protection, but little comfort. This woman says they have enough food and firewood to last a week. Around 300,000 people in Mariupol are living like this. Those without homes are crowding together in large buildings, over the weekend, an art school with around 400 people inside was bombed and destroyed. This video gives a sense of what these large shelters are like. It's from a theater where around a thousand or more people were staying, mostly women, children, the elderly. Days later, it was blown apart in a suspected airstrike. The Russian word for children, marked out in huge letters outside, provided no safety. Katerina Yaskaya lived across from that theater and delivered food and other aid to the people hiding out there. She tells us it's difficult to describe the sympathy she felt for them, 
They were terrified, cowering in horror at the sounds of planes overhead, always afraid of a bomb dropping. Alevtina Shvetsova lived under Russian attack in Mariupol for 21 days. This is not just a city, she says, this is my whole life. She survived without power, in freezing conditions, with little food, with eight other members of her family until the building was hit. They pulled dead neighbors from the rubble and decided to leave the city. Alevtina says she can't imagine life without Mariupol. She will return. But now in her burning city, there are lots of people, lots of children under the rubble, others in shelters. Ukraine's defense minister says the people defending Mariupol are saving lives all over the country. They are slowing Russia's advance by drawing its fire. With the invading force yet to claim a single major city, the desperate battle for Mariupol has taken on symbolic importance for both sides of this war. Erin. Phil, thank you so much. Out front now, Artur Shevchenko. He escaped Mariupol on Friday with his wife. And Arthur, I am so grateful to you for talking to us and, and recounting um, the, the, the horror that you had to endure and witness. What was it like in Mariupol when you left? Well, uh, it was terrible. Like a lot of shelling, a lot of bombing, a lot of burned down uh, buildings, cars, a lot of shattered glass on the streets from these buildings. A lot of uh, people on the streets, or, or, which, which like like they, they were cooking food on the bonfires. Uh, like it was it was terrible. I know, Archer. While you were in Mariupol, because of the constant shelling, you had to spend days inside. What did you see when you went outside that it, that just truly shocked you? The the most when you saw it well one one day like one one night i i saw the, the i i looked into the like eastern part of the city and i saw like it, the the sky went like red it was like really uh, like something was burning there and it, it was like the whole horizon like from the east side of this city and i understood that there were some like uh, shelling, bombing, uh, f f fighting, uh, burning, like, etc. It was really, really shocking for me. I know the food and water situation in Mariupol is a catastrophe. Archer, I've heard about people who have been forced to, you know, drink melted snow or to drink from puddles. Mm -hmm. What was your experience with just the basic essentials of life, food and water? Well, it was strange because, uh, like, maybe on the the fifth or sixth of the siege, I understood that all my thoughts were about food, like what I was eating in the morning, what I will eat in the evening, where I will get the food, water, like like basic instincts. It it was um, hard to to imagine, like. Were you able to get food and 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 where 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 were you able to get food and water? Well, uh, we we had a lot of news before the war from the U.S. government saying that uh, Russia will attack. There are a lot of troops over Ukraine with in the, inside the Belarus, inside the uh, western part of the Russia. Uh, at, the, at first. We were skeptical about this, but uh, I, 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 I thought, what if this is true? And I bought some uh, buckwheat rice, uh, and uh, that's why we basically had some food because of this uh, stock that I bought uh, like two weeks before the war. Wow, so that may have been what saved you and your family. Yeah, yeah. Arthur, I want to show everyone a video you took in Mariupol before you were able to get out a few days ago. You were inside a shelter while there was shelling outside. I'll just play what you shared with us. What 
was that moment like? Well, it was strangely like peaceful. Mm. It was. It was. It was like uh, uh, while we were like was chilling and but we were listening to music and it was some connection to the previous life. All right, Arthur, I appreciate your time. I'm so, so glad that you're out, um, but I am so sorry for what you have endured and what so many who you know are still enduring there. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to thank you for highlighting this, for, for telling truth to the, to the world instead of, like, we, we had a bad example of Ru Russia, which tells, like, lies from the television, and it's good to that you are showing the truth. Thank you. And next, I'm going to speak to a Russian actress whose famous father spoke at Putin's pro-war rally that won over the weekend. She's now speaking out against Putin and taking on her own father tonight. Plus, the incredible story of one Polish family, one that has taken in 46 Ukrainian refugees. Why have you opened up your house to so many people? Because we should. It's, it's in Polish tradition, I think. 